Um, so this is my journal club. Um, if you guys remember from like way back when in didactics, when Dr. Jejo was still with us, um, I miss her already. <laughs> she kind of talked about like using emollients um, on a daily basis for kiddos that were like at high risk of developing eczema. And usually our high risk kiddos are going to be the ones that um, have, you know, a first degree relative with eczema. So this is kind of a new study that came out literally a couple weeks after Dr. Jejo did the um, lecture when she was talking about that. And I thought it was kind of interesting because it was the same people that did the first um, study. So we'll talk about what happened. So these are object objectives. Um, I'm pretty sure these are the same objectives as every single uh, journal club, so I'll skip over that. So just a review on eczema or atopic dermatitis. I know we all know what it is, but uh, basically it's just kind of like this itchy, inflammatory disease of the skin. Um, lots of names for it. Uh, usually it's, um, you can see it with like allergies and um, asthma. So just like the ATP or atopic diseases. And it affects one in five children. Um, Family history is a major risk factor. So your highest risk kids for developing eczema are going to be the people with the first degree relatives. Um, and then children with eczema are, is, are likely to develop things like you know, allergies and all of the other atopic diseases. So a little bit of kind of the idea of why originally we were thinking that if we, you know, lather these kids up with daily emollients um, to prevent eczema, essentially uh, the idea behind it is when you have eczema, your um, skin is kind of already impaired. And uh, it's seen with like a loss of function mutation with FLG sometimes. Not all people with eczema have that mutation, but it's a common one. And so it really contributes to the skin barrier and the integrity of that. So what happens is the barrier is already affected um, or, you know, compromised. And because of that, there's a lot of allergens that are coming in and out, cause, um, causing more um, likelihood for it to cause an inflammatory reaction and therefore cause eczema. So if we protect that skin barrier by, you know, using a daily emollient or something, then hopefully we can prevent uh, the risk of incidence for eczema. So originally there was that one trial that Dr. Jejo uh, mentioned, and it was the trial in 2014, same institution who did this current one, and it suggested that daily emollients um, used for the first six months after birth can reduce the development of eczema by 50%. This was a very, very tiny study. Um, there's actually another study in Japan too that did the same thing. Um, so what they did was do a bigger study. So the original study was 124 infants. Well, this one was 1,394 infants. The difference though is um, this smaller study, they actually had uh, groups of kids in the U.S. and the U.K. And uh, if you guys looked at the study recently, this one was mostly just the U.K. Um, but actually, it was 100% the U.K. So a little bit of study design. Um, this was a randomized control trial. So as you can see, it's not like the best of the best, um, but it starts somewhere. So you need a couple of randomized control trials. And then if you have a bunch, then you can clump them together into a systematic review and stuff such as that. So uh, it's a study in which people are allocated to random um, treatments and to receive one of several interventions. And then you compare the interventions. Um, best experience are usually when the research group and the patient are blinded. So the PCOTT question of this journal club is, population is term infants with high risk for developing eczema. The intervention is an emollient cream. What they used here was diplo-based cream or double-based gel. And you might be wondering, what is that? 
Well, unfortunately, in the U.S., we don't use that at all. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But it's actually really common in the U.K. to use, especially for eczema. Um, comparison is just standardized skin, skin care advice. Um, and then the outcomes were a development of eczema by age two. So if they had it or they didn't have it. Um, type of question is basically a preventative uh, medicine question and the type of study is a randomized control trial. So emollients there, like when I was talking about like the emollients and everything, the smaller pilot trial, like I said, had a little bit of patients in the UK and the US. Um, in the UK, they did the same double base gel and the Diplo cream, a Diplo base cream, which is a liquid paraffin um, or a white soft paraffin. And there's kind of like a bad connotation to paraffins in the US. I mean, we have some, but not a lot. Um, and I think it kind of happened a couple of years ago with the whole like baby powder thing. Um, and I don't think there's a lot of basis to it, but there's, we just don't have a lot of paraffins in the U.S. So what we normally use are things like Cetaphil, Aquaphor, things that have ceramides in it, uh, in contrast to paraffin. So this study, because it was using something different, uh, that's just something to keep note of. Um, one of the things that they did mention is none of the emollients offered sodium lauryl sulfate. So a lot of the uh, paraffin-based creams, they have sodium lauryl sulfate, and it's um, it actually causes skin breakdown, and it adversely affects the skin barrier. So they tried to control for that by making sure their products didn't have that. Um, they measured primary outcomes basis, basically um, by diagnostic criteria for eczema. So, you know, in clinic, when we see eczema, we, we think, oh, it's eczema. And we usually, you know, do the normal things like Vaseline, baths, and getting them um, emollients really quickly um, within the first two minutes, that or we start steroids and such. But we never really actually um, assess how bad the eczema is. And so there's this whole thing of major criteria of what eczema is and um, the morphology of where, whether or not it's flexural or, and everything. So you, to have True atopic dermatitis, so this is how they try to make, um, you know, a very subjective diagnosis objective uh, was using this diagnostic criteria. So uh, you need three or more of the major criteria, uh, which is itchiness, um, typical distribution, flexural lichenification in adults. So that doesn't really apply to us uh, in pediatrics. And then um, facial or extensor involvements. Um, if you remember back to the uh, dermatology grand rounds from way back when, uh, oftentimes atomic dermatitis, it has like the entire face, but then it spares like the tip of the nose. Um, and then for dermatitis, uh, chronically or chronically relapsing, and then also just a personal or family history of any kind of atopic disease. And then there's three, you need three or more minor criteria as well. And there's a whole list um, and most of the time, this list probably most of us don't even remember or think of because when we diagnose it here, it's just usually a subjective, is it flaky, scaly, red, angry, itchy? Um, so it could be like cataracts, colitis, conjunctivitis, eczema, perifollicular attenuation, um, facial pallor, erythema, food intolerance, hand dermatitis, uh, ichthyosis, IgE just a ton of things that we really don't always think about. So it's just kind of a good way to look at, hey, they, this is how they try to make something super subjective of a diagnosis really objective. Um, and they measured secondary outcomes as well. So it wasn't just if they got eczema, they were looking at um, the presence of eczema between birth and two years and presence of visible eczema um, so it's not just if they, they kind of put a little bit of subjectiveness to it too. Um, like if a provider decided that they, the child needed some kind of cortical steroid prescription. 
they also tried to score the eczema, um, which is interesting because they didn't really do much statistical analysis on it. So they tried to see how bad it was. And uh, you can do scoring of the eczema based on like the body region and the percent of the body area. So this is the EASI score. And then you also rate it from a zero to four of none mild, moderate, and severe, four being the highest in redness, thickness, scratching, and lichenification. And then based on the uh, severity score, you can get a score between zero and 72. They also did the POEM score to see, um, to also do an idea of how bad the eczema was. Um, and this is basically, so with this, um, it's based on how often or frequent the eczema is. And it's more subjective based on the patient and based on the family. And something that they use this for more so is um, like lifestyle or if it, you know, helps in general. Um, Um, so they also measured some other secondary outcomes as well, such as presence of other allergic diseases, um, wheezing, allergic rhinitis. They also looked into certain food allergies like eggs, milk, um, uh, and they also uh, reported um, any kind of clinical report of food allergies, oh, and also peanut allergies, sorry. So the inclusion criteria for this study is essentially you have to be a term baby, so healthy, um, high risk of developing eczema. So your high risk people are going to be someone with a first degree relative uh, with either eczema, allergic rhinitis, or asthma diagnosed by a doctor. Um, the mother has to be 16 years or older, and um, the consenting adult must be able to understand English. Exclusion criteria includes preterm birth, sibling, um, uh, or twin that was already inside the trial, um, severe widespread skin conditions um, that could make like eczema assessment difficult, serious health issues that kind of increase your comorbidity uh, and comorbidity, um, a condition that would also make the uh, emollient inadvisable. And then they did some randomization. Um, they used a computer to basically generate a code, and only the programmer knew the coding, which is cool. Um, but for masking-wise, unfortunately, you can't really mask everybody. You can't, especially since you know your family is going to be the people who put on the emollient. So if they're not receiving an emollient, they know that they're automatically in the control group. So unfortunately, it was a single blind study, not a double blind study. Um, for the most part, they tried to keep everybody else blinded. And with data collection, um, they basically had a bunch of research nurses that would survey and screen the families. Um, and they did it in the third trimester to kind of get the family prepared for the study and make sure they knew what they needed to do during the year with the emollient. Um, and then with follow up, they would follow up uh, at the two week visit uh, by telephone and then um, three, six, 12 and 18 months old. And then at two years, they um, masked the research nurses to make sure that they didn't know whether or not they were in the control or the treatment group. And they um, had them do skin exams, uh, saliva samples for the FLG mutation, skin prick testing, and questionnaires. So, it, like, really, they got a lot of information. But when you look at the article, they didn't really do all the statistical analysis that they could have done. Um, so, participants, participants who also had the positive skin prick test, um, they, if they wanted to see if they had a, a true diagnosis of a food allergy, they were invited to um, go and do a food challenge at hospitals that. Uh, were experienced, but I don't think they actually um, put that into their, oh no, they did for the eggs and um, peanut and 
milk. Sorry. Da, 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 da. So statistical analysis wise, um, adjusted relative risk and difference in risk for the primary outcome were estimated using generalized equations and basically just they, they used the program to just hit a button and they, they found the adjusted relative risk. And we'll talk a little bit more about what adjusted relative risk is for people who don't remember like I don't remember. Um, the results to this study, and this is just basically the big picture. Um, at age two, 23% of infants in the treatment group um, ended up getting eczema and about 25% of infants in the control group ended up getting eczema. Adherence to the treatment was 88% uh, reported at three months. And then um, I don't think it was 2%. I think there's a number, another number, sorry about that. And then at six months, it was 74%. So high numbers, I think it was 82. Um, adjusted relative risk was 0 0.95 and with a confidence interval um, between 0.78 to 1.6 a p-value of 0 0.61. So in general, there was actually no difference between the groups. And that's kind of disappointing seeing as prior to that, we were seeing about a 50% reduction. So it kind of goes against everything that we were taught <laughs> and everything that we've been doing since 2014. So conclusion is no evidence that daily emollients during the first year of life actually prevent eczema in these high-risk children, um, but some evidence do, does suggest an increased risk of skin infections, which is a little strange because I thought we were protecting the barrier. So we're going to do the critical appraisal like we always do. And we're going to go through the questions. Um, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. All right, cool. <laughs> so are the results of the trial valid, the internal validity? Um, were the assignments of the patients to the treatments randomized? Yes, they were. They were randomized by a computer, and the only person that knew how the computer worked was the programmer. So, um, and they also used uh, internet-based randomization, so. And were the groups similar to from the start of the trial to the end of the trial? Yes, they were. Um, or at the start of the trial, the emollient group and the control group, they had very similar um, demographics. And you can see that in this beautiful table. Aside from the allocated treatment, were groups treated equally? And with this, it's kind of a yes and no. So inside the article, they say yes, um, because other than the emollient group receiving the treatment uh, and proper use of emollient, both groups received the same kind of skincare advice and the follow-up schedule and how to seek medical advice and basically the same treatment in general. However, we couldn't really control certain things. Uh, like for example, if they're getting standard skincare advice, likely parents are buying other types of lotion, whatnot, to put on their kid for just general skincare. Um, and they couldn't really control what kind of lotion those parents bought or what they used in general, or if they were smothering their kid with coconut oil, who knows. Um, the other things that we couldn't uh, account for it were other home medications because they didn't report that in the study. And then the other thing was like if there was use of probiotics um, or antibiotics, actually, since there was an, uh, they saw like an increased risk for skin infections like in Patigo. Um The other thing that I noted was like they didn't really separate between the gel or lotion, like if they were using the Diplo base cream or the gel and whether or not the gel was better than the lotion or the lotion was better than the gel. Um, were all the patients who entered the trial accounted for uh, and were they analyzed in the groups to which they were analyzed? Yes, there was very minimal losses, only less than 
So super high retention rate, um, only 12% lose loss to follow up in the control group and 13% loss in the emollient group. So that's about the same amount of loss equally throughout the trial. <clears throat> and this is kind of like the graph showing where they lost people. Um, so yeah, you guys have any question about this? Uh, and Dr. Finkler says the study reported the control group emollient use was about a 15 to 20% contamination. Got you. So I guess they so they were using that, but they couldn't really quantify or like figure out what other emollients they were using. So they couldn't treat them equally because you know they were using different types of lotions and whatnot. Um, so were measures objective, uh, or were the patients um, and clinicians kept blind? So measures were actually subjective, but objective as possible, like I was saying. Um, because when we diagnose eczema, a lot of the times it is just looking at if it's subjective or, you know, if it looks like eczema. Like if it acts like a duck and then it looks like a duck, then it's like a duck. But um, <clears throat> since they tried to keep it as objective as possible using the um, scoring systems as well as the criteria for um, eczema, it was the best they could do. And unfortunately, this was not a double blind study because of the limitations of the study in general, but it was single blind um, as parents couldn't be blinded since you know you would know if you're putting lotion on your kid or not. Some of the results, so how large was the treatment effect? Is there a difference between the control or treatment um, or in an increased or decreased incidence of eczema? And the answer is no. So going over adjusted relative risk, if you guys remember, adjusted relative risk is essentially um, you're getting a risk of how, uh, how high, essentially if you have one, then the treatment has no effect. And if it's above one, then your risk is um, higher. And then if it's lower than one, then the risk is lower. So because it was one and it was adjusted, then there was no effect um, between the two groups. And then as well as relative risk reduction, the zero means there was also no um, effect. And then they also did a lot of things with allergy, um, which is interesting because they separated all the different allergies with the adjusted relative risk compared to whether or not, you know, the gel or cream were um, separated. So with this, again, there was no difference in either study. It was about the adjusted relative risk for all of these is about one. So really no effect. And then the largest effect, though, was um, the eggs which was an adjusted relative risk of 1.56, but still really just not very promising. Um, external validity wise, <clears throat> so kind of does this actually help me with my patient care? So should I stop recommending all of these things like uh, daily emollients? It's hard to say really because um, you know, emollients are the mainstay treatment for eczema, it, we, and we have been recommending it to prevent eczema in the high-risk kids. Um, it's just that this study has a lot of, I guess, it doesn't fit in the U.S. as well. So, for example, they were using, um, this study had a very high amount of Caucasian patients, as well as a very low representation of Asian, Hispanic, and African Americans. And as we know, our um, Hispanic and African American populations, they usually have the worst cases of atopy. Um, 
And secondly, the, they were required to understand English, which uh, decreased a big portion of the Hispanic population. Um, and then kiddos with serious health issues were also excluded from the trial. So there's that. And then is the treatment actually feasible in my setting? Yes, it's feasible. You can easily, you know, put uh, lotion on kids, but um, the potential um, benefits of the treatment outweigh the harm. So because this whole treatment showed that you had an increased risk for, you know, skin infections like impetigo, that is kind of harmful. And even though we had been doing it um, here since 2014, I'm not quite sure how it affects us since Again, we use a different type of emollient. We use like the ceramides and everything, and UK was using paraffins. And then the other thing with that is, if you read into the the actual methods, they were giving them like huge um, like canisters of this emollient. And if you don't have smaller um, emollients and you're just constantly using it from the same kind of, I don't know, thing, it causes like a petri dish almost. So maybe there was ways to like decrease that. Um, but the whole idea of increasing risk for that skin infection, so the mean um, per child was 0 0.23 with a standard deep of 0 0.68 in the emollient group and um, mean of 0 0.15 with a standard deviation of 0 0.46 in the control group. Um, and the adjusted incidence ratio was 1.55, so a little higher side. Um, so uh, with the adjusted incidence rate ratio, that is higher than one patient does have an increased risk. Um, and so that when you read this, it doesn't mean that the patient is at an increased risk they are actually just 1.55 times more likely to develop a skin infection, if that makes sense. Um, so a little bit about discussion of like the entire study. So adherence to advice to apply emollients might not have been sufficiently high um, enough to have an effect. Not only that, but uh, they were concerned for like insufficient quantities uh, used daily because they didn't really tell the parents how much to use on a daily basis. Um, they just told them to do it once a day. And then uh, there was concern of false reported um, adherence when they uh, were writing the paper in discussion. Um, emollients also, like, like I said, were paraffin based. So it's not really common in the U.S. for us to use paraffin-based emollients as we normally use aquaphor Vaseline, which is petroleum-based, um, and or Cetaphil, um, or uh, a lot of the other ones that we use are ceramides, really. So I think what we need to do is actually do a study here in the U.S. using ceramides or, or you know, the brands that we normally use for our kiddos. Um, also, they only did once a day treatments and they didn't look into multiple treatments a day. And it was hard to tell how much the um, treatment group actually was putting on other types of emollients uh, on their kids and how many times a day that was going on. And then the other thing would be if we were to redo the study, I think um, we would have to look into decreasing infection rates. So like hand washing prior to emollient administration or like after you bathe your kid, you wash your hands before you stick the um, uh, daily emollient on them. And then maybe even like smaller containers of the emollient so we don't have petri dishes for the kids. And then it didn't really, even though it went through all like the poem scoring and everything, they didn't really um, risk stratify if the treatment helped decrease the severity of eczema. So I think that's that's something important that should be looked into. So in conclusion, the 
study is really discouraging for me because, you know, we had been recommending this emollient use um, since 2014 to prevent eczema for a while now. And now that we have like a huge larger study, it shows that there wasn't really a difference between the control group and the treatment group. Um, but I also think that this can't really be applied to our population. Um, and then really, we just need to do something that isn't paraffin based so that we can use some of the more common uh, lotions and emollients that we use here in the US. Um, and then the other thing that um, so uh, I looked into was future studies should be done to see if you know we can get a decreased risk for the severity of eczema or combined food allergy um, introduction and emollients, if that together can affect eczema rates as well. So that is it.